neuroscience as a field got its start with the Golgi stain. This was the stain that Camille Golgi developed in his kitchen that labeled a small subset of cells that allowed you to see them in their full glory. And you could see them in their full, full glory because it was only labeling a very, very small subset of cells that were randomly distributed amongst many other cells that were not labeled. This was a breakthrough and it, it revolutionized uh, in the late 1800s our view of how the brain was organized. But um, it's not enough. It was insufficient. And over the years, I think people have been thinking about ways of getting more information. You can um, inject cells with dyes. Again, you see a small subset. You can stain tissue to find molecular markers that show you which cells are of a particular type. But if you're interested in circuits, what basically you have to do is see every cell that's connected, each as an individual entity each as an entity that's separate from every other one. And many of these cells that are separate from each other are not molecularly very different. They just happen to wire differently based on experience. And so we've been trying to come up with techniques that would allow us to see every cell as a unique entity. And we took advantage of this revolution in fluorescent proteins. The green fluorescent protein known as GFP uh, is an amazing discovery that uh, received a Nobel Prize in chemistry a few years back that gives um, an ability to put a genetic insert into the genome of an animal that will make it produce a protein that when you shine one wavelength of light on it, it will give off a fluorescent color that's shifted slightly to longer wavelengths. This is the key about fluorescence, which is you shine, for example, a, what's known as a black light, an ultraviolet light that you can't see with your own eye, but that can activate pigments that will then glow bright red or bright bright green, and all fluorescent works that, fluorescence works that way. So the green fluorescent protein is a protein where you shine blue light on it and it gives off green light. And shortly after green fluorescent protein was discovered, organic chemists began understanding why it was fluorescent and realized that they could mutate the green fluorescent protein to make a red version or a yellow version, which would f fluoresce different colors. And uh, several groups in Russia for example, discovered that there were a whole range of marine animals that, uh, like corals, that had fluorescent pigments in them that were very similar to green fluorescent protein but different colors. And those gene products could also be put into animals. So now we have a wide range of colors that can be put into animals, but certainly not enough colors to make every cell in the brain a different color. There's not enough colors. But there is this interesting fact that we humans see all the colors that we see with only three kind of photoreceptors in our own eye. We are only sensitive to red, to green, and to blue. And it's the combination of how much red, green, and blue signal there is in each little part of a visual scene that gives each part its own unique color. So we thought, well, if we could put a random amount of red, green and blue fluorescent protein in each cell, each cell would be some color in the spectrum of the rainbow and we'd be able to see lots of cells. So that's what we did. Jean Levey was a postdoc when he began this work. He now has his own lab in Paris and Josh Sains, a colleague of mine here, uh, and I, uh, with the help of several other really smart young people, built um, a tool that made mice that generated lots of colors in each nerve cell. And it's a form of recombination where you take a genetic insert and you randomly cause a subset of the colors that could be expressed to actually be expressed. So each cell ends up with a rather different color spectrum than each other cell. And this is the brainbow approach and you know we've gone on to make brainbow viruses uh, so that you can inject any animal and infect their brain with with these colors basically to get each cell a different color. So this is a tool that is good for tracing. It's extremely good in the peripheral nervous system. For example, the motor neurons that go to muscle fibers where there's not much else out there. This is great. You can trace wires very long distances. You can map virtually everything in the wiring diagram. 
When you use tools like Brainbow in the central nervous system and you label everything, you're immediately discouraged by the massive amount of things that are there. And they're so dense that a light microscope often has trouble disambiguating the wires even though you have lots of colors. So we've been trying to think of other ways of, of kind of getting beyond the, the technical difficulties. And one is rather than trying to look through a volume of brain, let's slice the brain really thin. And for us, really thin is about 30 nanometers thick. And a nanometer is, is, is really small. That's 10 angstroms. That's 10 hydrogen atoms thick. So 30 nanometers is about 1,000th as thick as a human hair. So that's how thick our brain sections are. They're very thin. And we've made an automatic tool. Um, Ken Hayworth and Richard Schleck built this tool that um, cuts brains at that thinness and then picks them up on a conveyor belt of tape. So we end up with this long tape where each section of the brain is 30 nanometers in front of the section before it and this gigantic tape. So you take a volume of brain and you linearize it onto a what looks like a piece of movie film. And then we take a picture of each of those frames, and if you play through that movie, it's like playing through not a time lapse, but a space lapse, where you start in the front of the brain and you go back and you can follow every little wire, every little direction. And so we're using that tool, mainly with electron microscopy now, to trace out virtually every wire. We call it a saturated connectomic reconstruction, where we do connectomics, but we label every single wire and get every single connection. And it's um, dense um, data. It's about 2,000 terabytes per cubic millimeter, so it's a lot of data. And you know we're running out of storage all the time, and uh, <laughs> analysis is a tremendous problem. But we are making great progress, I think, because we started at nowhere. <laughs> we have a wide range of technical problems with this work. I've already mentioned one, which is uh, the fact that the density of the, of the material means that the amount of data you have to collect is extraordinary. And this problem is one that can be solved you know, basically by resources, just buying more storage, hoping the price of storage comes down. It has. You know, when I began, the notion of a gigabyte uh, seemed extraordinary. You know, I, I grew up in the world where my first Macintosh had 512K, and then there was a one megabyte <laughs> Macintosh, which I thought was amazing. So to have uh, memories of gigabytes was remarkable. But then we began dealing in the world of terabytes, and terabytes seemed impossibly large. And now we're saying, okay, terabytes aren't so bad, but petabytes, thousands of terabytes, that's real serious. So I, I have a feeling this is not going to be the, um, the, our Waterloo, you know, where we finally can't go any further. I don't think storage is going to be a big problem, but it is a problem, but it's not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem, I think, the one that, we're, that still keeps me up every night, is how to analyze this data. We have been analyzing a little piece of mouse brain that is one billionth the size of the whole mouse brain uh, for the past four years. That's all we've been doing is analyzing this one teeny weeny piece. And it's just extraordinary how much you can analyze in something so small. To imagine doing this over larger scales is still very hard. And I have a feeling this is a field that sort of like other fields in biology, is going to be taken over by more talented people, mathematicians, physicists, engineers, computer scientists, and that will generate the data, but then they'll analyze it. Because uh, we're, we're amateurs at anal analysis. We know what's interesting to analyze, but we're not really good at building the tools for analysis. So I think this is a, a maturation of our field that has not yet really happened, but it's just beginning now. One big question about this field of connectomics and of making tools like this is, what, what do they hold for us in our future? And I would say one extreme view, and maybe uh, an exciting one, is that if you had complete wiring diagrams of the brain, uh, if these tools really gave you that, you could then put those wiring diagrams into something like silicon. You could make a virtual brain that is inspired not just at a distant way, but 
synapse by synapse inspired by a physical real brain. And therefore, you might have intelligence that is like uh, biological intelligence now instantiated in computers. So that's one interesting uh, idea. Another one that may sound like science fiction, but it's also a very provocative idea at the moment, it's still science fiction, is that once you have a wiring diagram like this, you can send this wiring diagram out into space at the speed of light. And so if an intelligent community somewhere very far away wanted to get a sense of what we're like, uh, instead of sending our bodies, <laughs> you could send our minds. <laughs>